The next item of business is portfolio questions, and today it is health and sport. Can I make another plea for succinct questions and answers, please? Question number one, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding <laughs> Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it can confirm that the new accredited specialist endometriosis unit will open in Glasgow in April 2019. Jean Freeman. Thank you. I'm delighted to confirm that the West of Scotland Specialist Accredited Severe Endometriosis Service is expected to be fully operational from April this year. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that heartening answer. Uh, despite endometriosis affecting one in ten women, it still takes an average of seven and a half years for a woman to be diagnosed. While there is no cure for endometriosis, having a diagnosis enables women to receive appropriate treatment, stay in work by having a condition understood and managed and make informed choices about fertility. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that reducing diagnosis times should be, should be a key priority for the new specialist unit? Jean Freeman. I'm grateful to Mr Gibson for that uh, additional question. Uh, I do agree that for this unit and indeed for the two other units in Aberdeen and Edinburgh, reducing diagnosis times uh, should be and indeed uh, is a key priority. Uh, but I also recognise that part of the length of delay in diagnosis is in part due to the diverse symptoms as well as a lack of reali reliable diagnostic tests with no solid evidence uh, yet into what causes endometriosis to occur. So we have taken some additional steps uh, to assist in this uh, situation. Last year, we invested 162,000 in a study with the University of Edinburgh to inform the design of a large UK-wide clinical trial for this condition. And we have engaged recently with Endometriosis UK to discuss possible areas of mutual research interest. So research, coupled with the three specialist centres in Scotland, will go some way, I believe, in raising awareness amongst the public and, importantly, among healthcare professionals to facilitate access to speedy diagnostics and the best treatment available. Supplementary from Monica Lennon. Thank you. In a recent written response, the Cabinet Secretary said that the Glasgow Endometriosis Centre activity has been modelled on an expected demand of 20 cases a year. I'm surprised at that low level, given that one in 10 women have endometriosis. Will the Cabinet Secretary advise how this figure was reached and will she give her assurance that women in Glasgow and the surrounding area will not be forced to join long waiting lists for much needed treatments? Jean Freeman. Uh, I'm grateful to Ms Lennon for that. The, the uh, estimate of the number of patients is, of course, done using a number of factors, including the use of the service in Aberdeen and in Edinburgh, and uh, what clinicians in the area that the Glasgow Centre uh, will serve, the West of Scotland, anticipate uh, to be their demand. And that is the basis on which the centre has been designed. It can, in fact, actually accommodate up to uh, 24 patients. However, what I said earlier about research, uh, improved diagnostic testing and so on, would I expect over time, as the research proceeds and the diagnostic tests are developed, I hope, through the clinical trials, that we may then see a, a, a significant increase in cases. We've got that in mind for all three centres, and we will look at how the, how the centres progress in order to be able uh, to increase the capacity if that is something we need to do. Question number two, Gordon Lindhurst. <clears throat> To ask the Scottish Government what role participation in sport and leisure plays in the health of the population. Joe Fitzpatrick. Being physically active is one of the very, very best things we can do for our physical and mental health, whether through sport, active forms of recreation such as walking or gardening, or active travel. There is abundant evidence that it helps to prevent heart disease, strokes, diabetes and a number of cancers. It plays an important part in helping us maintain a healthy weight and reducing the risk of developing depression. Sport and physical activity are also a powerful means of addressing isolation, building community cohesion and developing confidence. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, I thank the Minister for that uh, answer. The Minister may be aware of cuts to Edinburgh Leisure's budget, which are symptomatic of the financial pressures this government has put on local authorities. Um, price increases have been announced recently by Edinburgh Leisure, including a reduction in the discount rate for over 65s by 10%. Does the Minister agree that making sport and leisure facilities more expensive for elderly people in particular is a false economy, especially in Edinburgh given the current crisis in social care? 
Joe Fitzpatrick. Obviously, um, all um, local authorities, the same as the government, have to make decisions about the priorities that are within their responsibility. And these areas which are within Edinburgh uh, Council's responsibilities are, are just that. And I don't think the member would... Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm assuming the member doesn't support the idea that the Scottish Government would come and tell councils how to um, uh, uh, do, go about their business. As I understand it, in, in Edinburgh Council, when the budget was decided, there was not a proposal from the Conservatives at Edinburgh Council, Edinburgh City Council, to, um, to provide further funding to Edinburgh Leisure. And, and also, of course, in, in this chamber, um, uh, had the Conservative parties um, budget proposals come through. They've been £500 million less for across the whole range of our budgets, and that would clearly have impacted on Edinburgh Council, amongst others. Supplementary from Mark MacDonald. Dainston Medical Practice in my constituency is one of over 700 parkrun practices in the UK where patients and staff are encouraged to get active at their local parkrun, whether that's walking, jogging or running. Does the Minister agree that it would be great to see more medical practices taking on parkrun practice status? And would he also join me in congratulating the volunteers who put on Aberdeen Parkrun, which will celebrate its 400th event this weekend? Yes, I agree with all the points that the member makes. Um, park runs are a, an, an amazing phenomenon that's taken off right across Scotland. And um, um, I'm, I think I may be signing myself up for some here, but I would encourage members to um, go along and, and experience um, the, the fun. And I think I have just signed myself up to go along to the one in Dundee. <laughs> so. Question number three, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve NHS Lothian's infrastructure in order to cope with East Lothian's rising population. Jean Freeman. The £70 million East Lothian Community Hospital is due to be complete in August this year with capacity for 132 inpatient beds together with 14 day beds for minor surgery and endoscopy patients. NHS Lothian are also currently developing a business case for a 2.8 million extension to refurbish Harbour's medical practice in Kilkenzie and build an extension. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. East Lothian population is actually the second fastest growing in Scotland with population projections for 2026 predicting a near 10,000 person surge from regional migration alone. So can I ask the, the Cabinet Secretary if she can guarantee that the new hospital has been future-proofed to meet the needs of East Lothian's rapidly rising population, and if she has commissioned an impact assessment on how the rising population will affect NHS Lothian's overall provision of care? Jean Freeman. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms Ballantyne is, of course, correct. Uh, population figures uh, show that the highest growth uh, is uh, one of the highest areas of growth, 23% between 2012 and 2037 uh, is projected for East Lothian, with the highest growth in the population being amongst those ov over the age of 65, uh, increasing by something like 72%, many in single occupant households. All of those factors are factors that a board is expected to, and indeed a health and social care partnership in this instance, given the, the split, if you like, in that rise in population, are expected to take full account of as they plan their services ahead. Uh, I believe that East Lothian uh, and the, the Council and the Health and Social Care Partnership there are fully cognisant of these figures. Uh, indeed, uh, some of them uh, came from those sources. And the board is actively engaged with that knowledge in both what I have already announced but in looking at what else it needs to do in terms of the provision, particularly of primary care and intermediate care services. Question number four, Johan Lamont. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Sue Ryder report, A Better Grief. Jo Fitzpatrick. Welcomes the helpful focus on bereavement that this uh, report brings. My officials have recently met with Sue Ryder to discuss some of the themes contained in the report. Officials are exploring with NHS, independent and third sector colleagues as to how the messages in the report can shape our bereavement work to help ensure that people with grief can access the care and support that is right for, for their individual circumstances. Johan Lamont. Can I thank the Minister for that, that response? The Minister will know from this important report that 70%, 72% of people have been bereaved at least once in the last five years. But only 40% of people know what kind of help or support to offer someone who is bereaved. Can the Minister outline what plans the Scottish Government has to carry out research into the availability of bereavement support and the impact of different types of bereavement services as proposed in Sue Ryder's A Better Grief report? 
Joe Fitzpatrick. The government is in, in discussion with a number of organisations, including um, uh, uh, the Palliative Care, the, the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care. Um, and, and as I said, we've um, met with Sue Ryder in order to understand how we can better provide support. Um, I, I recognise the members. Um, um, long-standing interest in supporting um, bereaved families in this area and I would be happy to meet with her if she wants to discuss how, how we can take that forward. Quick supplementary, please, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I firstly want to um, thank and congratulate Sue Ryder and Hospice UK for this report, but specifically there was an ask within it around local primary care teams identifying and signposting support for people. I think that's really important. Many of us will meet people and constituents who are in that position. Could you ask your question, so could I please? Ask, um, whether or not the government will help support this and fund p potential posts in GP surgeries? Joe Fitzpatrick. A accessing uh, support is, I think, an important thing. Bereavement is um, a unique to each individual and bereavement services have to be flexible and connect with local net networks which may provide support. As I've said, officials are, um, have, have discussed with Sue Ryder and are in discussion with other um, partners as to how best we can do that. Um, so that's including uh, cruise bereavement care. Um, so I think that this is an important area. I think it's an area that we can work across the parliament on um, in order to, to, to make sure that we are providing the best possible um, support that is right for, for individuals. Um, we've specifically asked the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care to work with NHS Inform to improve the online content that's available relating to palliative care and end of uh, life uh, and bereavement care. Um, but I think it's an ongoing process that we need to continue to do what we can to make those services better. Question number five, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on GP out of hours closures at Glenrothes Hospital. Jean Freeman. Uh, the out of hours service at Glenrothes continues to be closed uh, because, uh, often at short notice, uh, because of ongoing difficulties in securing staff for rotors. Patients who require to be seen during these periods are redirected to another centre or may be provided with a home visit if that is more appropriate. Uh, however, the Health and Social Care Partnership have made some progress, recruiting an advanced nurse practitioner on the GP rota, an advanced paediatric nurse practitioner who is now seeing patients. Additional advanced nurse practitioners were also appointed in January, and the Out of Our Centre is now a practice placement for students. Nonetheless, I continue to keep in touch with uh, the Health and Social Care Partnership about how much more progress they can make in this area. Jenny Goldruth. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, both Glenrothes Area Residents Federation, uh, who submitted a participation request, and North Glenrothes Community Council have been assiduous in their commitment to ensure that we don't lose our GP out of our service in Glenrothes. And whilst I appreciate that decision is not ultimately in the Cabinet Secretary's gift, will she agree to meet with my constituents to discuss their concerns? Jean Freeman. Uh, the member will be aware, I'm sure, that NHS Fife met to discuss uh, the Glenrothes Area Residents Federation participation request on the 15th of March. Uh, they also met St Andrews Community Council regarding their participation request on the 14th of March. These dis discussions are ongoing. I think it is important that we allow the board and the community to conclude them. I will be kept up to date on these and I'm happy to discuss uh, that further with Ms Gilruth once we know the outcome of these discussions. A quick supplementary, please, from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Glenrothes is not the only hospital affected by these closures. St Andrews Community Hospital is facing similar difficulties. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what pressures are being placed on the Scottish Ambulance Service, given concerns from the student population that the Victoria Hospital is just too inaccessible? Jean Freeman. Um, the, the Ambulance Service have not raised any specific issues with me in that regard, although uh, I have had discussions myself uh, with uh, one of the GPs from St Andrews and indeed an outline discussion uh, with the principal of St Andrews University uh, in terms of the additional steps that they are taking, but looking in particular at whether or not we can be more cooperative between that university and our National Health Service and the partnership to see how we can deliver an adequate service to that part of North East Fife. Question number six, Ross Creer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to address patient access issues at GP practices. Jean Freeman. 
Uh, the new GP contract will improve patient access to GP practices by increasing uh, the uh, transparency on surgery times and making a wider range of healthcare professionals available to patients. Our, in addition, our commitment to increasing the number of GPs by 800 in the next de decade will, will ensure that GPs can spend more time with patients who need to see them. The latest figures show that we now have a record number of GPs in Scotland, an additional 75 GP and GP registrars. Uh, targeted initiatives like ScotGem, an increase in undergraduate medical education places and increasing undergraduate training in primary care settings will, in, will I believe, ensure a sustainable GP workforce in the future. Ross Greer. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. One of the welcome objectives in the new GP contract, uh, the NGMS contract that she mentioned, was the redistribution of some of GP's workload to other relevant staff. The problem is patients don't know about this, and we've got quite a lot of anecdotal evidence now that GPs are spending quite a portion of their 10-minute appointment times explaining the changes to staff. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline what steps she's taken to fulfil a commitment she's made to ensure greater patient awareness of this change? Jean Freeman. I'm grateful to the member uh, for that additional question and I'd be very happy uh, to have from him where that anecdotal evidence is coming from in terms of particular practice areas because I have information that there are many patients across uh, different parts of Scotland who are benefiting from that additional uh, access to other professionals. There are ways in which we can help those independent contractors and we need to remember they are independent contractors to our health service but there are many ways by which we can help them uh, make sure that information is available to patients uh, and through community pharmacies and so on and I'd be very happy to look at the particular issues that Mr Greer is raising and see what more we can do in those areas. Question number seven, Willie Coffey. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government what the mortality rates are for cancer, heart disease and stroke in the Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley constituency and how these compare with Scotland as a whole. Joe Fitzpatrick. ISD Scotland does not routinely publish data at the constituency level. However, I can provide the member with data from Ayrshire and Arran Health Board. The latest mortality data shows that in Scotland over the last 10 years, stroke mortality has reduced by around 42%, heart disease mortality by 36% and cancer by 10%. In relation to Ayrshire and Arran Health Board, ISDN figures show that cancer mortality is reduced by 2.1%, stroke by 43% and heart disease by 30% over the same period. These figures show that there is continued downward travel in the health board area. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Minister for that answer insofar as it gives us a position across Ayrshire but I hope we can at some stage in the Parliament begin to produce data on a constituency basis which most of us represent. I wonder if the, the Minister agrees with me about the clear link between poverty and ill health which has been a consistent problem in my part of Ayrshire for many years and he could, could he give me some indication of what the Government is doing to try and address this and help close that gap? Joe Fitzpatrick. Scotland has seen uh, significant improvements in public health, but there are deep-rooted and historic issues with population health which are working, we are working hard to address through a number of our strategies. We know that heart disease and stroke and certain cancers like other uh, lifestyle-related illnesses are most pronounced in areas of deprivation. Tackling these inequalities can only be done by tackling the, the root causes rather than simply trying to address the consequences. So that includes ending poverty, paying fair wages, supporting families and improving our physical and social environment. These are all areas where we are, are putting a real emphasis on across the government. Of course, these issues um, are um, made much more difficult to um, address by the UK government's continued welfare reform programme. Question number eight, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how the provision of a care and treatment hub at Pitlochry Community Hospital will improve health care for Highland Pressure residents. Jean Freeman. Uh, the care and treatment hub will bring services uh, together, such as phlebotomy, wound care, post operative wound care management, suture and ulcer care, and by doing so will increase access to appointments. The Perth and Kinross Health and Social Care Partnership intends to have the hub open from October 2019 and the provision of these services through the hub will also uh, self-evidently free up GP time to spend longer with patients who need their particular skills. Murdo Fraser. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, that answer and from the information that's been uh, provided. There is a lot of interest in the community around Pitlochry 
and, and Highland Perthshire in terms of what is currently being proposed. C can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how the community will be involved in designing the services that are available uh, and what information has been made available to them uh, about exactly what is going to be an offer from October? Jean Freeman. Uh, the, on the latter part of uh, Mr Fraser's question, a very good uh, supplementary question um, about how the community will know what is being made available. Uh, I'm very happy to ask the local partnership to send me, and I will share it of course with you, uh, Mr Fraser, their detailed plan about what are the various outlets, uh, pharmacies and so on, the GP practices by which they are going to make that information av available uh, to potential patients in the local community uh, and how they can make use of those. Uh, and of course, uh, I think using social media is always a particularly good idea in this instance. My understanding is that the original uh, thinking and the design around the creation of the hub uh, came from feedback from patients. But again, I will make sure that that is the case. And that in terms of, um, if you like, the feel of the new hub, that they have an involvement in that uh, through the community council or by other means. Uh, and again, I will make sure that Mr. Uh, Fraser is aware of that. That concludes portfolio questions and we'll shortly move on to the next item of business.